Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chapter 8. We're going to be talking about joints. So, remember, we've talked about balance between joint stability and joint mobility. Remember, the simplest human joints are usually less mobile and more stable. The more complex joints usually allow for greater mobility, but are less stable. So the more movement you're allowed, such as in your hips and your shoulders, the more injury can occur and the more stable a joint is, the less likely it is to become injured. Okay, it's great to understand that the more complex joints are likely to malfunction than simple joints, but what is the joint structure even made out of? Well, if you remember, we have talked about cartilage and collagen and elastin and ligaments and tendons briefly before. But right now we're going to start talking about collagen. Collagen is pretty intense stuff and it is one of the main components of your joint structure. It's the primary fibrous component of the extracellular matrix in dense fibrous tissue, all right? It's it's the heavy duty stuff that holds your skin firm and intact. Um, it helps make up your fascia. It really holds you together. In fact, collagen has a tensile strength similar to that of steel and is responsible for the functional stability of all connective tissue structures. Collagen fibers are non-elastic, so they don't stretch but they still provide limited mobility. In the relaxed position of some structures, collagen fibers assume a wavy configuration called a crimp. I don't, rem I don't know if any of you remember the crimping hairstyle of the 1980s, uh, but just think of that, like crimping your hair. The crimp or wave can be straightened, allowing for some flexibility in the structure. Collagen also has piezoelectric properties that generate small electrical currents. Remember this from bones? Small electrical currents when it's deformed. Collagen oscillates or vibrates if electrical currents travel through it. Okay, so collagen is a thick white fibrous tissue. Now we're going to talk about a thinner yellow fibrous tissue called elastin. Elastin has elastic properties that allow fibers to return to their original condition after a stretching force has been applied, sort of like a rubber band. The arrangement of the collagen fibers, along with the collagen to elastin fiber ratio in various ligaments and tendons, determines the ability of these structures to provide stability and mobility for a particular joint. The fibrous component of the extracellular matrix in ligaments contains greater collagen content than elastin content. However, the ratio of collagen to elastin fibers and their arrangement vary considerably among different ligaments. So we can assume, although I hate to assume that the stretchier or more mobile a ligament is, perhaps the more elastin is in it. All right, so the next thing is the joint capsule itself. The joint capsule is a dense fibrous connective tissue that is attached to the bone and forms a sleeve around the joint. It's sealing the entire joint space. It provides passive stability by limiting movements and the capsule varies in thickness depending on the joint. It's locally thickened to form capsular ligaments and may also incorporate some tendons. We also have ligaments. The cells within ligaments are fibroblasts. Ligaments consist of 70 to 80% collagen, which gives the tissue tensile strength. Elastin fibers in the extracellular matrix provide some flexibility. Now remember that percentage shifts a little bit, so we have about 10% play of elastin fibers. The extracellular fibers are arranged in the same direction, forming a regular arrangement. Ligaments are avascular, meaning they do not have a blood supply, so A meaning without, Vascular, meaning uh, vascular as in blood supply to it, they are avascular, 
so they do not have a blood supply the way that skin and organs do. Ligaments obtain nourishment from the blood vessels in the membranes around the joint. Uh, we are going to talk more about interstitial fluid later on, but there is some seepage of nutrients going on in this area. Extrinsic ligaments are found on the outside of the joint capsule and physically separate from the capsule itself. Intrinsic ligaments are actually thickenings of the articular capsule. So we have ones that are extrinsic and intrinsic. X meaning exit, it's out of there, and in meaning that it's inside. Now while ligaments attach bone to bone, tendons are the ends of our muscles. Tendons like ligaments are composed of dense, regular connective tissue. They connect bone to muscle. Remember, ligaments are bone to bone, tendons are bone to muscle. In addition to the usual connective tissue components associated with tendons, loose areolar connective tissue forms complete or partial sheaths around them. Double layers of connective tissue around the tendons at the wrist and hand form complete sheaths. These tendons sometimes are called sheathed tendons. The sheath protects the tendon and produces synovial fluid, which helps to reduce friction. It's kind of, it's a very thick, viscous fluid, like a very thick oil in your car. Tendons help stabilize joints in that they pass across or around a joint to provide mechanical support. However, they can limit the range of a movement in a joint. Imagine trying to bend your finger with five or six rubber bands wrapped around it. You can still do it, but your mobility is now limited. Next up, we have bursae. A singular bursae is a bursa. A bursa is a flat sac of synovial membrane in which the inner sides of the sac are separated by a fluid film. Bursae are located where moving structures are apt to rub against each other. Subcutaneous bursa are located between the skin and the bones. Some subtendinous, so below the tendons, subtendinous bursa are located between tendons and bones. It's below the tendon above the bone. Submuscular, below the muscle bursa, are located between muscles and bones. Submuscular, below the muscle above the bone. Although most of us have bursa in the same places, bursa can form as a response to demand if the body needs additional cushioning. The bursa in this image are highlighted in blue. All right, now we're on to cartilage. Cartilage is usually divided into three types, which is white fibrocartilage, yellow elastic cartilage, and highline cartilage. So this first image is of white fibrocartilage. White fibrocartilage consists of primarily collagen fibers and forms the cement in joints that permits little motion. This type of cartilage also forms the intervertebral discs and the menisci in the knees. Yellow elastic cartilage is found in the ears and epiglottis and differs from white fibrocartilage in that it has a higher ratio of elastin to collagen fibers. Yellow elastic cartilage, more elastin, it's elastic. Yellow elastic cartilage is more opaque, meaning less see-through, flexible, and elastic than highline cartilage, and is distinguished further by its yellow color. The ground substance is penetrated in all directions by frequently branching fibers. Highline cartilage forms a thin covering of articular cartilage on the ends of the bones in freely movable joints in the adult skeleton. Highline cartilage forms a smooth, resilient, low friction surface for the articulation of one bone with another and disperses joint pressure over a wider area. Highline cartilage distributes any additional stresses applied to a joint and helps absorb some of the pressure imposed on the joint surfaces. These cartilaginous surfaces are capable of bearing and distributing weight over the lifetime of a person. I mean, my knees have taken one for the team. 
assuming the individual has normal biomechanics. <laughs> no, I feel attacked. No injury, attacked again, and no habits that wear down the cartilage. I These knees really have taken one for the team. Holy smokes. Water is the most abundant component of highline cartilage. All right? Water is important. Drink your water. Water is the most abundant component of highline cartilage. It needs that liquid to reduce the friction. And when combined with protein substances in the ground substance, it forms a stiff gel. How fortuitous. Our next image is that of a knee. It's a healthy knee joint, so it's not my knee. Uh, that's for sure. We're going to talk about synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is a thick, viscous, slippery fluid that contains hyaluronin, which is hyaluronic acid. It is a mucus-like component of synovial fluid. Okay, Synovial fluid is secreted by fibroblast-like cells in the synovial membrane and interstitial fluid filtered from the blood plasma. Synovial fluid is distributed during joint motion when the cartilage is compressed. So you move your knee, you flex it, your joint is compressed, or the, I should say the cartilage is compressed, and synovial fluid squirts out. The fluid flows back into the cartilage after the motion or compression stops. Because hyaline cartilage in the adult does not have blood vessels and nerves, its nourishment is derived from this back and forth flow of fluid. All right, we're going to learn again about the interstitial fluid later on in anatomy, um, in advanced anatomy when we talk about the cardiovascular system and some other systems. So don't panic about that now. For right now, just think about that cartilage as being a sponge. And when you squeeze it, the synovial fluid drips out. And then when you release the sponge, it soaks it right back up. The free flow of fluid is essential for the survival of cartilage. The whole thing needs to stay damp. You don't want to be walking around on some dry sponges. All right. This synovial fluid is an aid to reducing friction. The effects of immobilization in which compression of joint surfaces is absent or diminished can cause hyaline cartilage to degenerate. Viscosupplementation is a joint fluid therapy that involves the injection of a gel-like hyaluron into a joint to supplement the viscous, meaning thick and slippery, properties of synovial fluid. This treatment is especially effective in the knee. Man, I feel so attacked about the knees. So they inject basically um, heavy-duty oil into your knee instead of the regular uh, 30 weight or 20 weight we use in the winter to drive our car, you're getting that thick Lucas 50 weight in your old antique hot rod. Our last part of the joint structure is bone. It's almost like we just covered bone last week. Bone is the hardest of all the connective tissues found in the body. As with other forms of connective tissue, Bone consists of a cellular component, a ground substance, and a fibrous component. Next up, we're going to briefly cover mechanical forces acting on the body, like external forces or forces that create loads on soft tissue by pushing or pulling on the body in a variety of ways. Internal forces or forces that create loads on soft tissue um, like misaligned joints or poor body mechanics, and that causes soft tissue to shorten, tighten, lengthen, and or weaken. All right, tissue load. This forces load soft tissues during massage application. Tissue load creates stress in the tissues, and tissues exposed to force are considered to be loaded. During massage application, applied force, if there's too much load, the tissue might fail and be injured. Too little load and tissues may not respond as desired. The change in the shape of the tissue, deformation, in response to the load is called the strain. Too much strain and tissues can be damaged. Not enough strain and the tissues may not respond and adapt. Okay, everyone. This is where your book gets serious in relation to 
you as a massage therapist, a future massage therapist. You're going to want to look at activity um, 8.3 a little bit. Box 8.2 in your chapter 8. Box 8.2 is huge. It's several pages. And I pulled a lot of these images from 8.2. I'm going to go over them. But you should definitely print them. You should keep them uh, tucked in along with your trail guide. These are um, really good information about uh, mechanical forces, external forces placed by a massage therapist onto your client. Um, and I definitely want you to pay attention to them. All right. So just to briefly go over. And I'm sorry you're staring at this boring image while I'm talking for a moment, but we have the anatomical tools of our palms, forearms, fingertips, knuckles, and so on used to apply force to soft tissue. All right, remember a force is something that causes the movement of the body to change or soft tissue structures to deform. So we're pushing on our clients, so we're deforming them. Friction is a force that acts in an opposite direction to movement. So friction is a force that holds back the movement of a sliding object. Okay, now this first image that I have up here for you, um, the pink stuff is the soft tissue. The uh, hard tan stuff is the bone. And here we're looking at a compression force. This image is of compressive force. We are pushing down on this back. We are deforming the soft tissue underneath our palms and our fingers. This is compression. This next image is also downward compression. This is broad based contact. This is the entire forearm pressing down onto the leg. This is broad. The whole forearm is a broad surface area compressing a broad area. This is a narrow or small point of contact for compression. We are still pushing down into the tissue. We're jamming it into the bone um, and we are pressing down with fingertips here. So it's a very narrow surface and we are pushing downward. All right, now we're talking about tension stress or tensile stress. This occurs when two forces pull on an object in opposite directions to stretch it and make it longer and thinner and try to pull it apart. For example, you're pulling a rubber band. It puts it in tension or being subjected to a tensile load. The primary load that a muscle tissue experiences is a tension load. When the muscle structure contracts, it pulls on the tendons at both ends, which stretches a little. So the tendons are under tensile stress. The example in this photo, um, it's not as clear as I would like it. It looks like her one hand is superior to the popliteal space. It should be below it to be anchoring the top of those gastrocnemius muscles. Um, to pull it one direction, but she is pulling above the knee towards the head. So she is pulling upwards with her hand and then with the forearm pushing down on that calf towards the foot. Um, so she is doing a, a tensile load. She is pulling that muscle apart by anchoring above and then pushing it downward to stretch the top portions of those attachments. This image is showing shear stress. Shear stress is two forces acting parallel to each other, but in opposite directions, so that one part of the tissue is moved or displaced relative to the other part. Shear stress causes two objects to slide over one another. When an anatomical tool moves on the client's body during massage, there is shear stress. This sliding creates friction. So this image shows the angles that you can come at the body to apply your force. And we need to talk about vector quantity here. Vector quantity is an important consideration with force. Um, it has three variables. It's the point of application, where are you putting your hand? It's the magnitude, how strong are you doing it? And the direction, are you going straight down? Like the bottom portion of this image, are you going straight down towards the floor? 
Are you going along the muscle? Are you going up to the head or down to the feet? Or are you doing a nice 45 degree angle? Um, I like to do between 50 to 70 degrees usually when I'm doing myofascial myself. Um, if someone's a little bit too tight and we need more horizontal, maybe we'll do 75, 80 degrees. This is something that you definitely will play with. Uh, the more straight down you go, the more you're just compressing that soft tissue into the bone. And the more horizontal the, you go, the more you're sliding across the skin. All right, so in this image, we're looking at another compression method. We're pushing straight down. It's perpendicular. You see that the foot is the flat 180 degree and the compressive force is coming down from a 90 degree angle. So there's approximation, which is pushing ends of the tissue together. If you're like pinching them, pushing tissue against another tissue. Um, so you're pressing your arm down on the soft tissue, which is pushing down into the hard tissue of the bone, applying pressure directly into the tissue. There's direct pressure techniques. Uh, this is often used interchangeably with static compression and ischemic compression. So we're not moving it, we're just pressing down into it. Here we have a gliding method. Um, so we can talk about stroking, Swedish massage, classic effleurage, it's a stroke applied in a smooth, continuous motion that does not lose contact with the client's skin. You can do this with the forearm, uh, which this person is doing up the leg. You can obviously do it with your hands as well. This is an elongation method. Um, crossed hands stretching, fascial spreading, the pin and stretch where you place your hand on one section and then you pull and stretch with the other arm pulling, leg pulling, all different types of traction. These are all um, elongation methods. We're stretching out that tissue. This little bend here, I didn't really see much image uh, coverage in your book to talk about a bend. You could be, um, let's say your client is laying supine and their thigh is there available for you. And instead of gliding up the thigh, you're going to put your palms directly at the midline and then you are going to press down, glide towards the table on either side of the leg um, or the arm if you're working on the arm and the arm is coming up between your palms and your palms are going down to the table on either side. So you're just spreading that tissue down and wrapping it around on either side of the bone. Here we have torsion, twisting methods. We're gonna need, we're gonna skin roll, we're gonna pull, we're wringing it, we're twisting it back and forth, all this fascial torquing. Um, you can do a Swedish or classical petrissage with this as well, but we're just grabbing that meat and twisting it around the bone. Here we are pinching and we are lifting and spreading. You see how the little diagram shows the fingers spreading up into like a little crescent moon shape. We are doing some petrissage and skin rolling and we are also doing spreading in here. This is another form of torsion and twisting methods. This is kind of a pin and petrissage thing. It's, it's kind of like skin rolling, but not really. He is pinning with fingers and then cupping that tissue around it. Um, this looks like older skin. I, I don't know the client, obviously. I'm just looking at a little image here. Um, you know, I would be careful doing something this aggressive with a geriatric client. They have fragile skin. I really hope they used a, a thick emollient, you know, something uh, like shea butter or something pretty oily that really soaked into the skin to make it supple here before they are doing some aggressive maneuvers on some ancient paper skin. All right, so this image is an oscillating method. All right, what's oscillation? You're making waves. Examples are vibration, rocking, jostling, or shaking. All right, rocking the body um, resets the nervous system in some areas. It's actually super cool. Um, definitely look into rocking 
uh, further into your school and massage therapy career. Um, it's a super easy but super cool move for the body. Uh, jostling, that can be a little jarring. Shaking, mm, you can shake the legs. Shaking, shaking the meat off the bone is, is kind of fun um, for some people. For those with uh, hip issues, uh, joint instability or joint pain, since we're in the joint chapter, uh, that's a contraindication. I wouldn't recommend shaking for those clients. Um, in this instance, we're looking at a vibration going back and forth very fast, um, kind of like cross fiber friction. If they're actually moving uh, their fingertips a little bit side to side and they're working that tissue back and forth, but they could just be staying mostly still and just sort of very lightly going back and forth, that would be vibration. All right, this is where you all get to turn into drummers. These are percussive methods like tapping, hacking, cupping, slapping, beating, pounding, and clapping. Um, you know, don't do it on the glutes. Don't get accused of spanking, please. Um, tapping is uh, doing it with your fingertips. Hacking is doing it with the um, semi-loose sides of your hand. Cupping, you can put your hands in a cup shape and beat it down rhythmically like a cup. Slapping is using your open palm and fingers and smacking someone. Beating is usually a loose closed fist and you're sort of pounding on it. Pounding is a tighter fist and a little stiffer at the wrist. And clapping um, is sort of an open palm again, but with your hand sort of half cupped up and doing a uh, clapping on the body. These, uh, these work a great on about 40% of clients in my personal experience. Some people love them. Some people hate them. If someone has COPD, um, chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease, if you're tapping on the bottom of the rib cage to knock out that mucus, it'll help give them a productive cough. So there's definitely some pathologies that these percussive methods work great for. But for your average client that wants to come in for relaxation, uh, they might be a little startling or a little jolting. Alrighty, on page 259 in your book, uh, we're going to talk about hypomobility and hypermobility. Hypomobility is when the range of motion is less than what normally would be permitted by the structure. The joint is hypomobile, remember? Anytime we talk about hypo in the body, we're talking about less than. Hyper is excessive or more than. So if you have hypomobility in a joint, you have less movement. Um, here we have some uh, fuzzy cartoon images of hypermobility. Um, that is caused by a failure of the joint to limit motion, right? The bony or the soft tissues don't restrict it enough, but this means that it makes it unstable. Remember, the less structure it has, the more unstable it is. I just keep referring to your book. This is the one chapter, well, three chapters. Chapter 7, 8, and 9, you really want to look at your book. But um, for the joints, uh, especially here, chapter 8, I definitely want you to refer to your book several times. I have a couple of images of box 8.3 here. These are more terms describing joint movements. I suggest you copy them into a file and keep them. I'm going to put them in your resources section for you for the week. So you're going to see those joint movement term sheets in your um, extra resources. It won't be for a grade or anything, but definitely a fantastic thing for you to keep. I want you to hang on to that. Um, this will be wonderful for you later for kinesiology, sports massage, for your emblex, et cetera, et cetera, and for your massage therapy career. Again, this is box 8.3 in my hard copy version of the book. I'm not looking at the e version right now. It's on page 262. Um, they do line up quite well, though. Again, this is box 8.3. Okay, everyone, so we are going to go kind of counterclockwise on this image from your textbook. If you're interested in seeing the image for yourself, I believe it is on page 266 in your book. 
and we're going to use it to talk about the classification of synovial joints by their movements. So the first type of joint we're going to talk about is a uniaxial joint. A uniaxial joint is constructed so that the motion of the bony components um, is allowed in only one of the planes around a single axis. Okay, so there's only one real type of movement allowed. There are two type of joints in this category, and they are hinge joints, which is at the bottom right of this image, and pivot joints directly above it. A hinge joint allows flexion and extension in one direction, changing the angle of the bones at the joint as in a door hinge. The examples are the elbow and the inter- phalangeal joints, so in between your phalanges, in between your fingers, these are hinge joints. So go ahead, just flex your fingers and then extend them. See how they only bend in one direction and then straighten again. A pivot joint allows rotation around the length of the bone. A pivot trochoid joint is a type of joint constructed so that one component is shaped like a ring and the other component is shaped so that it can rotate within the ring. Examples are the joint between the first and second cervical vertebrae, between your axis and your atlas, and at the joint at the proximal ends of the radius and the ulna. Okay, now we're going to jump weirdly um, across the top of this image here, and we're going to talk about biaxial joints. Biaxial joints allow movement in two planes around two axes. The two types of joints in this category are condyloid joints up in the upper left-hand side of this image and saddle joints in the upper right-hand side of this image. A condyloid or condylar joint is also called an ellipsoid joint. This allows for movements in two directions, but one motion dominates. The joint surfaces in a condyloid joint are shaped so that one bony surface is concave and the other one is convex. The movements allowed are flexion, extension, abduction, an adduction, so we're bending, we're straightening, we're taking away from the body, and we're adding to the body. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. Examples are the wrist joint, the metacarpal phalangeal MCP joints, so at your metacarpals and your phalanges, so your big knuckles on your hands, the meta. Tarsal phalangeal MTP joint. So this is the tarsals and the phalangeal, or excuse me, the metatarsals and the phalangeal joints in your toes, the big knuckles of your toes, and the atlanto occipital joint. All right. So where atlas meets your occipital bone, or C1 meets your occipital bone. In a saddle joint, each joint surface is convex in one plane and concave in the other, and these surfaces fit together similar to a rider on a saddle, just like you're riding a horse. Movements that are allowed are flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and a small degree of axial rotation. So we're bending, we're extending, we're taking away from the body, we're adding to the body, and we're doing a little bit of rotation. Flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and axial rotation. Examples are the joint between the wrist and the metacarpal bone of the thumb. This is your first carpo-metacarpal joint and the sternoclavicular joint, all right, between your clavicles and your sternum. Still continuing to move counterclockwise, we're going to talk about triaxial joints. Triaxial joints are joints in which the bony components are free to move in three planes around three axes. Motion at these joints may also occur in oblique planes. The two types of joints in this category are ball and socket joints and plane or gliding joints. A ball and socket joint allows movements in many directions around a central point. 
Ball and socket joints are formed when a ball-shaped convex surface is fitted into a concave socket. Movements allowed are flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and rotation. This type of joint gives the greatest freedom of movement, but is also the easiest to locate. Remember the rule, the more it moves, the less stable it is. Examples are the hip and the shoulder joints. A gliding joint, also called a synovial plane joint, permits gliding between two or more bones. This joint allows only a gliding motion in various planes. Examples are the superior tibiofibular joint, acromioclavicular joint, the costovertebral joints, and the zygophyseal joints between the vertebral arches. All right, now we're going to do a throwback to chapter 7 for a moment and talk about cranial sutures because these are technically the joints of the skull. All right, remember that the coronal suture is between the frontal and parietal bones. The sagittal suture is between the two parietal bones. The squamous suture is between the parietal and temporal bones. And the lambdoidal is between the occipital and parietal bones. Your book contains some palpation hints on page 267. I highly recommend looking at the trail guide um, to the body for a lot of palpation tips. It does not fall in line with the way that um, our essential sciences textbook flows. Uh, however, it does have phenomenal um, chapter by chapter going by body area palpation techniques, bony landmarks, and it does indeed talk about the joint structure as well as the musculature. So if you want to look inside each one of those chapters for what you are looking for, either bony landmarks or joint information or the musculature, it is a great uh, supplemental guide to what we're doing now. All right, the temporomandibular joint. This is a moneymaker, the TMJ consists of um, a couple of different structures. The joint type is a synovial modified hinge joint. The articulating bones are the temporal bone of the skull and the mandible, all right, your lower jaw bone there, that's your mandible. And you have several ligaments in there, all right? The TMJ is one of the strongest joints in the body and has only one biarticular joint, bi meaning two, so it articulates in two places, biarticular joint. This means that the joint has two separate cavities. This construction requires a balanced action in the joint so that both jointed areas work freely. When this is not the case, the result is TMJ dysfunction, all right? A lot of people get specialty massage for TMJD, temporomandibular joint dysfunction. The TMJ allows for five movements, depression, elevation, protraction, retraction, and lateral deviation to both the left and the right. There's more going on in the shoulder than what we uh, can even discuss. Uh, right here in a few moments. I really recommend going to the trail guide. I'm going to put up some extra resources for you guys, um, including some images out of the trail guide for you. Um, but I will touch over what your book states. Uh, but I do feel that the images in the book are not enough. I do want you to refer to the extra resources and your trail guide as well, because the shoulder is such an important area. And um, we have two minimal pictures here on page 269, and I really want you to see this in better detail. Um, but for now, since I am using the images from the book to keep you sort of in line, if you're following along with the chapter, let's talk about the glenohumeral joint, all right? The articulating bones are the humerus. Remember that's your upper arm bone and the scapula, your shoulder blade. It is a synovial ball and socket joint. Obviously, it has multiple uh, ligaments in there, and the glenohumeral joint allows the movements of flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, medial, internal rotation, and lateral, external rotation. 
You also have the sternoclavicular joint. The articulating bones here are your clavicle, you know, your collarbone, and the manubrium of the sternum. Remember, it's that top little portion of your sternum in your chest plate. The joint type is a synovial saddle joint. The movements of the sternoclavicular joint follow the movements of the scapula and clavicle because no muscle works directly on this joint. A decrease or loss of mobility in this joint directly affects shoulder movement though. This joint is the only direct connection between the axial skeleton and the sh shoulder girdle and the arm. The sternoclavicular joint allows the movements of elevation, depression, protraction, retraction, upward rotation, and downward rotation. Next up, we have the acromioclavicular joint. The articulating bones are your clavicle and your scapula. This is a synovial gliding joint, all right? The acromioclavicular joint may contain a fibrocartilaginous disc. Note that some people do not have an acromioclavicular joint because the bones have actually fused. Although a small joint, the acromioclavicular joint is important for shoulder movements. The acromioclavicular joint allows these movements of anterior and posterior gliding, upward and downward rotation, and elevation and depression. Movements that separate the joint are also possible. This is a short video of scapular retraction and protraction. Um, this is what it looks like in full action when you have uh, complete muscular control. Next up, we have the joints of the elbow. This is the ulnohumeral and radiohumeral joints. The articulating bones are the humerus with the ulna and the humerus with the radius. This is a synovial joint on the ulnohumeral aspect, okay? Because of its bony structure and the support of the muscles and ligaments, the elbow is a stable joint. Less uh, different types of movement means more stable. Most elbow action involves the ulnohumeral joint, even though the radius also interacts with the humerus. During flexion, the trochlear notch of the ulna slides on the humeral trochlea, whereas the head of the radius slides on the capitulum. In extension, the movements are reversed and stop when the electronon process reaches its anatomical barrier at the olecranon fossa. The elbow is one of the few areas in the body where a hard end feel and anatomical barrier occur. Hyperextension is possible in individuals who have a small olecranon process or a large olecranon fossa. So they don't have that bony structure there in place to help stop that movement and hypermobility can occur. The ulnohumeral and radiohumeral joints allow the movements of flexion and extension. The radio ulnar joint um, is the radius and the ulna. These are articulating bones. The three radio ulnar joints are the proximal, middle, and distal radio ulnar joints. It is a synovial pivot, a proximal radio ulnar joint. The interosseous membrane, now remember from chapter 7, that's that membrane between the ulna and the radius, all right? That forms the middle radio ulnar joint and connects the shafts of the ulna and radius. Its fibers run in a diagonal pattern perpendicular to one another. This membrane is taut. It's very tight during supination and relaxed in pronation. The distal radio ulnar joint is located between the distal ends of the radius and the ulna. The proximal radio ulnar joint allows the movements of pronation and supination. Here in figure A, you see supination, and in figure B, pronation, and you can see the bones crossing each other. You can see how in figure A, the interosseous membrane would be tight and stretched between them as the bones are separated and far away from each other, and then as they cross in pronation, how that interosseous membrane would then relax and become sort of bunched up and not so tight in between them. 
Next up, we have the radiocarpal or wrist joint. The articulating bones are the radius, the scaphoid, and lunate with some tricutral bone involvement. This is a synovial condyloid joint. The wrist is called the radiocarpal joint because the radius alone articulates with the carpal bones. The ulna joins the rest indirectly by a disc that articulates with the carpal bones. This allows forearm pronation and supination to take place without affecting any wrist movements. The joint capsule of the wrist is loose in the anterior and posterior directions, allowing easy flexion and extension, but it's tight laterally and medially, allowing for minimal ulnar deviation and radial deviation. The radiocarpal joint allows for the movements of flexion, extension, and radial and ulnar deviation. Hand joints. The intricate pattern of hand joints is where all of the movements involving the fingers take place. The hand is capable of a variety of functions that vary from the precise handling of objects and to acts of great strength. So you can do fine motor skills, gross motor skills. The opposable thumb allows us to grasp and manipulate objects. Because the thumb in the resting position is rotated relative to the rest of the fingers, the thumb faces the other fingers. The first carpometacarpal joint of the thumb consists of the structures of the first metacarpal with the trapezium. It's a synovial saddle joint. The first carpometacarpal joint allows the movements of opposition, abduction, flexion, and medial rotation, and reposition is adduction, extension, and lateral rotation. All right, next up is the pelvis, all right? The pelvis comprises three bones arranged in a ring. It has three important functions. It transmits weight from the axial skeleton to the lower limbs of the appendicular skeleton in the standing position or to the ischial tuberosities when sitting. It provides proximal attachments for muscles that insert onto and move the legs and it protects the lower structures of the digestive and urinary tracts as well as the reproductive systems. The joints of the pelvis are capable of tiny movement. Much of this movement occurs at the sacroiliac joint. Nutation and counternutation describes sacral movement in relationship to the movement of the ilium. Nutation is the forward motion of the base of the sacrum into the pelvis, called tucking your tail, or the backward rotation of the ilium on the sacrum. Counternutation is the opposite movement of nutation. A lordotic position or anterior pelvic tilt is created by the rotation of the ilium on the sacrum or backward motion of the base of the sacrum out of the, out of the pelvis. So basically wagging your tail. So in picture A, we're looking at the anterior tilt of the pelvis. All right, that little tail that you see off to the left there, that is your sacrum and your coccyx. And you see that it sticks out when your hips lean forward. In picture B there, it's the posterior tilt of the pelvis. This is nutation, and the tail is tucked in in this image. All right, so we have the sacroiliac joint. The articulating bones are the sacrum and the two ilia. It's part synovial in the anterior half and part fibrous. The movement allowed is very small, but important anterior, posterior, lateral, lateral, and medial rotation in a sideline figure eight pattern. This rotary movement of the pelvis, pelvis allows the vertebral column to remain relatively still as we walk. When the sacroiliac joint does not move, the sacrolumbar junction compensates for the lack of rotation, putting strain on the spine, very often causing low back pain. No direct muscle action occurs at the sacroiliac joint. Instead, the sacroiliac or SI joint moves as a result of other joint movements in the area. You also have the symphysis pubis. The articulating bones are the two pubic bones. It is a cartilaginous joint. It is a cartilage plug in the center there. 
All right, stability of this joint is super important. The joint connects the left and right coaxial or hip bones anteriorly. Should this joint become misaligned, which can happen during childbirth or trauma, such as a fall, the stability of the entire pelvis is compromised and many postural and soft tissue problems can result. The symphysis pubis allows for independent motion of each side of the pelvis, which is important when walking. It allows for that little bit of rotation as you take each step. Symphysis pubis motion is especially important during pregnancy and delivery. Um, fun fact, uh, when you are getting at the end of your third trimester, you actually get a hormone that will help soften all of the cartilage in that area to help that um, symphysis pubis actually spread apart a little bit. All right, you actually have the hip joint itself. The articulating bones are the acetabulum of the pelvic bone, which is formed by the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. And the femur, your leg bone, it is a synovial ball and socket joint, all right? It allows for a ton of movement, which means it's not that stable. There is a fibrocartilaginous ring called the labrum, which attaches around the edge of the acetas acetabulum and is reinforced by the transverse acetabular ligament. This ring helps hold the femoral head, remember that's the head of your femur, that top round ball of the femur, in place by increasing the depth of the acetabulum. The hip joint is a massive joint. Although it is a mobile ball and socket joint, the hip joint is less mobile than the shoulder joint because of the round head of the femur fitting into the deeper socket in the pelvis. This structure provides a little more stability than what the shoulder does. Therefore, the hip joint is less susceptible to injury than the shoulder joint. In anatomical position, the, fe the femoral head is not fully in the hip socket. A better fit is when the femur is flexed to 90 degrees as when sitting, slightly abducted, and laterally rotated. The most relaxed position is flexion, abduction, and lateral rotation. This is like when we're sitting in a relaxed position with our legs falling out to the side. If you sit like that continuously, though, you will get tightened piriformis and deep six lateral rotator muscles, but that is a conversation for another chapter. The hip joint allows the following movements, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, medial rotation, and lateral rotation. All right, joints of the knee. So the articulating bones of the knee joint are the femur, the tibia, and the patella. Although the patella slides around it as a sesamoid bone, remember, that's not actually attached. It's a synovial modified hinge joint, all right? So the knee allows for flexion, extension, a little bit of medial rotation, and lateral rotation. This image is of the knee joint sort of opened up. There is an anterior, posterior, and proximal view. Figure A is the anterior view of the knee joint. B is the posterior view of the opened knee joint with a more complete view of the um, posterior cruciate ligament. And figure C is where the femur is completely removed and it's showing the proximal articular end of the right tibia. All right, so when we talk about your ankle, the talocrural joint, all right, the ankle joint consists of the tibia, the fibula, and the talus. It is a synovial hinge joint. Motions of the ankle itself are limited to dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Inversion and eversion of the foot are functions of the subtalar and transverse tarsal joints. It's not actually part of your ankle joint. So here with this image, um, let's go ahead and talk about the foot joints first. The joints of the foot are the intertarsals, the tarsometatarsal, the MTP, and the interphalangeal joints. So the intertarsal is between the tarsal bones. The tarsometatarsal is between the tarsals and the metatarsals. 
the MTP between the metatarsals and the phalanges. The interphalangeal are between the proximal, middle, and distal phalanges. All right, remember the feet mirror the hands. We also have our joints of the spine and the thorax. So joints of the spine, we've already talked about the atlanto-occipital joint. The articulating bones is the atlas. Remember, atlas is C1 and the occipital bone at the occipital condyles at the base of the skull. This is a synovial condyloid or ellipsoid joint. The atlanto-occipital joint allows for flexion, extension, right lateral flexion, and left lateral flexion. We also have the atlantoaxial joint. The articulating bones are the atlas and the axis, which are C1 and C2. This is a synovial joint, which allows right and left rotation. We also have intervertebral disc joints. All of the adjacent vertebrae articulate with each other, and they have a cartilaginous symphysis. This is this disc that is in between the vertebrae. Individual intervertebral disc joints allow minimal movement. Movement of the spine as a unit is much greater. This image shows some motion between adjacent vertebrae. A to C, these figures here show vertebrae in their neutral positions. All right, there's vertebrae in extension. Figure B is vertebrae in flexion. And notice that the interspinous and supraspinous ligaments are being stretched. And in figure C, the vertebrae is in right lateral flexion. Again, everything on the left is in neutral. And then when we do flexion, extension, or uh, lateral flexion, this is what it looks like with the ligaments pulling on adjacent vertebrae. All right, this last image is of costospinal joints between the ribs and the spine. All right, the costospinal joints of the thorax consist of the costovertebral and costotransverse joints. The articulating bones are the ribs with facets and hemifacets on the adjoining vertebrae. These are synovial plane joints. The costospinal joints allow gliding. The sternocostal joints have the costochondral joints. The first through the seventh ribs articulate with a costal cartilage. The chondrosternal joints, the cartilage articulates with the sternum itself. These are cartilaginous and synovial joints. The sternocostal and costal spinal joints allow the movements. Similar to the movement of a handle on a bucket, like the movement of the thoracic cage occurs during respiration. So your ribs are going up, sort of like you're tugging up the handle of that bucket. And then as your exhale goes out and your rib cage depresses, all of your ribs go back down like the handle of the bucket. There's also some small movement at the ribs at the costal spinal joints, which produces large movements anteriorly of the sternum and laterally of the rib shafts. Those are those ribs that you see lifting up and out. That's what they're talking about, laterally of the rib shafts. That's the lateral side of your ribs, and you can see them raising greatly, right like that arch of that um, bucket handle. The result is a change in diameter of the thoracic cage that shifts intrathoracic pressure and enables inspiration to occur. So what that means is when your ribs spread outwards, when they spread laterally and superiorly, they go up and out and you have more space for your lungs, for inspiration, for your thorax, your rib cage to be filled with air. So when it comes to joint movement and massage, that is how we move an area to measure range of motion, all right? We also use joint movement to position an area for the application of muscle energy techniques to lengthen muscles and for stretching methods to elongate connective tissues. For this reason, massage therapists should absolutely concentrate on developing the ability to use joint movement efficiently and effectively. Joint movement is effective during massage because it provides a means of controlled stimulation to the joint mechanoreceptors. 
Movement initiates muscle tone readjustment through the reflex center of the spinal cord and lower brain centers. As positions change, the supported movement gives the nervous system an entirely different set of signals to process than when that client is simply lying there. The joint sensory receptors can learn not to be so hypersensitive as well. As a result, any protective spasms and movement restrictions may lessen as you work with those joints. Joint movement also encourages lubrication of the enhanced joint and contributes an important addition to the lymphatic and venous circulations. Remember that cartilage, when it's moving and you get that compression in the joint, it's like squeezing the sponge and that synovial fluid comes out and makes everything nice and slick in there. Much of the pumping action that moves these fluids in the vessels results from compression against the lymph and blood vessels during joint movement and muscle contraction. The tendons, ligaments, and joint capsules are all warmed from the movement, and the mechanical effect helps keep these tissues pliable. This is especially important for your bedridden clients or um, those who are disabled or partially immobile. Passively moving their joints for them is in an incredible help. Your book continues with some normal range of motion measurements for each joint. It's definitely worth um, keeping for future reference for kinesiology and for reference for right now. Um, as you practice in clinic, you'll definitely be working with range of motion and working on client joints. Please refer to your textbook starting on page 289 to go over some of the injuries that can occur to joints. Again, we're going to cover those in depth when you get into pathology. Um, your book only has three pages on there. I would love for you to read through them and just get yourself familiarized with those. They are also in your assignment for the week. And I will catch you guys for the next chapter. Have a great weekend.